Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. And Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6, and verses 15 through 20. From the 16th chapter of the book of St. Matthew, verses 13 through 23. Now, we know that you know how to read, so we don't want to read fast. The issue is not how well you can read. It's how well you allow the scripture to read you. And so let's just take our time and establish dialogue in the spirit. St. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 23, let's read together. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, say, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth, Jesus began to show on his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6 and 15 through 20. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Verses 15 through 20. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if they neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. That verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, 
that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Amen. You may be seated. We thank God for the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to reason together for a few moments from this subject, building the church at the gates of hell. Building the church at the gates of hell. Will you repeat that after me? Building the church at the gates of hell. Thanks be to God for these profound words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he makes an establishmentarian statement, a foundational statement concerning a word an identity, a force that had never been mentioned before. For the first time in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he uses a word that he has not used before. Not only is it that Jesus has not used it, no one else had the right to use it other than Jesus because the word and concept church is the intellectual property of Jesus Christ. So whenever you say the word church, you have just used something to which only Jesus Christ could give birth. Jesus is the one who conceives and births the church. And because no one else but Jesus uses this term, we would do well to understand how and why it is that Jesus says this word at this time. Because as you read together this morning, Jesus in this dialogue uses the word church three different and distinct times. And he uses the word church only three times, and they are within these chapters of Matthew 16 and 18. Even though the church is used by other writers in biblical development of its character, Jesus only refers to the term church three times, yet he refers to the term kingdom over 105 times. Notice that when Jesus uses the word church, each time it involves a state of conflict and resistance. The first time the conflict and resistance is from without. And the second two times, the conflict is from within. What is the occasion for Jesus to use this term, church? Jesus, in the 16th chapter of Matthew, finds that the time is right for me to talk about the word church because I'm in the final few days of my life on earth. By now, Jesus has been with the disciples for three and a half intensive years of ministry, of servant leadership, and kingdom building. He has been preaching and teaching and living the kingdom for 16 chapters. 
And now that he has invested kingdom infrastructure in his disciples for 16 chapters, he feels that it's right to use another term, church. And the reason why he feels that it is right to use this term, church, is because he's getting ready to die. Jesus can't use the word church in chapter 1 of Matthew because it would be premature. He can't use it in Matthew chapter 2 or 3. He can say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. He can preach the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 4, 23. He can even say, bless are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. But he can't say the word church yet because the time isn't right. After teaching the disciples for three chapters on the slopes of a mountain against the backdrop of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus invests three chapters, Matthews 5, 6, and 7, talking about kingdom principles, kingdom prayer, kingdom witness. But he can't say the word church yet. There are some things you are not authorized to say until God says it's time to say it. You don't just say whatever pops in your mind. You don't just say whatever can get on your tongue because you are a person who recognizes that you have the power of life and death in your tongue. And because you have the power of life and death in your tongue, your tongue ought to be connected not just with your brain, but with your heart. The writer says in Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, which means that if you're going to say something, your heart ought to be connected with God. To meditate means that God has literally saturated you with his purpose and power. For the word of God says, blessed is the one who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Look at the connection. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. I'm meditating in your law day and night so that when I'm given the right to speak, when I'm given a door of utterance, when I'm commanded to use the authority to give life through my tongue, I have meditated in your law day and night and the time is right to speak a word that will make us like a tree planted by the rivers of waters where we can bring forth our fruit in our season. Jesus recognizes that in order for the church to take hold and to grow, in order for us to grasp its significance, meaning with understanding, I've got to indoctrinate you for 16 chapters with the kingdom. And when he asked the disciples, does the world know who I am? Do they have a concept? Have they developed an opinion? And the disciples, in effect, says, well, not really. They don't understand you. They don't know you. They have not quite been able to figure out where you're coming from. They think you might be John the Baptist come back from the dead. They think you might be Elijah or Jeremiah or just a prophet. That's not the issue. What people on the street think about me, do you have any idea of who I am? You've seen me open blinded eyes and cast out demons. You've seen me step on the bosom of the water. You've seen me steal the tempest. You've seen me raise the dead. Does that give you an idea of who I am? 
Well, actually it didn't because when Jesus asked them that question, there is no answer from them. The answer comes because God breaks the silence and uses Simon as a medium to give a testimony that only God can give. For Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 25, I thank you, O Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, because you hid these things from the wise and prudent, and you revealed in them the babes. Even so, Father, because it seemed good in your your sight. No one knows the Father but the Son. No one knows the Son but the Father, and he to whom he will reveal him. It just so happened that after Jesus asked the question, who do you say I am? Do you even know me yet? The answer is no. They didn't know him. They admitted they didn't know him because they went a ship with him a few days before and a storm arose. Jesus, having been wearied with this journey and the challenges of ministry, dared to take a nap on the boat. And as soon as Jesus began to rest, that's when the enemy made up his mind, I'll kill every one of you. I hate the kingdom so much that since I'm the prince of the power of the air, I'll marshal the forces of nature that I can and try to swallow up every disciple that Jesus has along with Jesus in the boat. If it's up to me, Satan says, I'll drown you in the midst of the sea. Satan hates God's kingdom just that much. He wasn't man enough to come at Jesus face to face, so I'm going to try to sneak up on you and kill you in your sleep. The waves began to violently empty into that boat. I've been on a Jesus boat in the Sea of Galilee. I know what it means to look on either side of this lake and see the precipitous slope of the mountains. Winds come across it and violently dip down into the sea, for the Sea of Galilee is below sea level. And the disciples were caught off guard. They really believed they were about to die. And because they thought that death was imminent, they aroused Jesus and asked him, Don't you even care that we all getting ready to die? The disciples were afraid to die. And that's what the enemy wants us to do. But the fact of the matter is, it does not take as much courage to die as it does to live. And that is the challenge with which we find ourselves faced, that when you have so much callousness and insensitivity, when you have so much hatred, division, and confusion in the world, when there are wars and rumors of wars and nation against nation and cities that are literally being swallowed up in gun violence, the enemy is really saying, I dare you to live. It is as though he wants you to be afraid in your own house, afraid to look out the door, afraid to get in your automobile, afraid to go about your business. It's not death that I'm afraid of. The fact of the matter is God has given me courage to live. Why don't you look at somebody and tell them, I'm not afraid to live. Jesus is yet alive, even with the waves pouring into the ship, even with the storm trying to sink everything that Jesus has, trying to destroy the kingdom. The disciples said, we get ready to die just before we die. Jesus, don't you even care that we're all about to perish? They didn't understand Jesus wasn't afraid to live. 
And since I'm not afraid to live, let me set things in order. I know that this is a frontal supernatural attack of Satan on the kingdom, so let me just set the record straight. Peace! Be still. And when Jesus spoke those three seemingly innocent, innocuous, harmless words, the devil knew he meant it. And all of a sudden things got calm, the wind stopped blowing, the lightning stopped flashing, and then the disciples start backing off from Jesus. We thought we knew him. We don't know him. What manner of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey his command. And that is why Jesus in this vulnerable conversation says to the disciples, I know what they're saying on the street. That's not what concerns me. What concerns me is that I have 12 men around me, one of which is going to sell me for $19.20, and another is going to say he never met me, and 10 others are going to run from me and forsake me and leave me all alone. Not one of them could answer that question, who you say I am, but because the father knew Jesus and because the father couldn't stand the silence anymore, he took Simon and used him as a medium to say, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus looks into Simon's soul, you didn't say that, my father said that, my father which is in heaven revealed it to you that I am the Messiah. And because the father broke the silence and identified Jesus as his son and said that he's the one who has the authority as his son to build the church, Jesus claims this moment to tell us, that's why I couldn't say anything before now. I had to have the witness of my father. I had to have the affirmation of my father. Now that my father said it in your presence, let me just make a foundation foundational statement upon this rock I will build my church where you gonna build it Jesus right in the devil's face at the gates of hell why don't you look at somebody and tell them we're in a building campaign well you know most Congregations now, if they're going to build, if you're going to spend multiple millions of dollars to build, they want to go way out somewhere. Get you about 15, 20 acres of land, build you a multi-million dollar modern facility away from all of the craziness, away from all of the hustle and bustle, the violence. Go way out. But Jesus said, no, I want to find exactly where hell is and build it right in hell's face. That's why he can use church and hell in the same breath because that's where he builds it. He doesn't build the church in heaven. You don't have to say amen, just say hmm. He doesn't build the church on streets of gold. He doesn't build the church at the pearly gates. He builds the church at hell's gates and says the gates of hell can't stop me from building the church. Because you can't talk about building the church, Jesus unless you're willing to talk about dying. And that's why Jesus had to charge the disciple. I'm not ready for you to talk about this yet because you're not ready to preach this kind of message. You don't even know me yet. Now, how are you going to go out and preach me? You couldn't even admit, you couldn't even confess that I'm the Christ. How are you going to go out and preach Christ and you don't even know Christ? 
And you're not going to get to know me until after I'm crucified, buried, resurrected, and I send you to Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. You can't know me until you are filled with my spirit. You can't witness for me until you're endued with power. You're not ready yet. Well, Jesus, is there any evidence? Is there any proof they're not ready? There it is right there in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. That's what it takes to build the church. You know, every now and then I hear people say, I believe I'll start me a church. Well, if you want to start a church, let me just tell you what you got to do to start a church. Because the one that founded it, this is what he did. He had to die. He had to be buried. And he had to rise from the dead on the third day morning. Now, if you can do that, you can say, this is my church. If you ain't never died and went to hell and got up from the dead with all power, stop plagiarizing Jesus because you are a spiritual thief. You are using copyrighted material. Nobody has the right to claim the church as mine but Jesus. I dare you to shout. Run down the aisle on that. The church is Jesus' property. The church is his blood. The church is his spirit. If anyone have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The church belongs to Jesus. Come on, help me give God some praise. We're in a building campaign. Where you going to build? Build where there's confusion. Build where there's sin. Build where there's hate. Build where there's violence. Don't run from your problem. Run to your problem. Walk toward danger. If God be for us, who can be against us? I'm going to live. I have the courage to live. Live in the face of hatred. Live in the face of violence. Live in a divided country. Live even though the devil can't stand you it's Jesus that's keeping me alive come on and praise God for life through Jesus Christ no no Jesus says I know where to build the church which means that in order for me to build it I gotta leave home which is to say I gotta get out of heaven and I'm going to bring heaven down to earth. Thanks be to God that God prepared Jesus a body that could not only endure sin, death, hell, and the grave, but a body that after having gone through the torture of the crucifixion is better after the crucifixion than it was before the crucifixion. Jesus looks better after he dies and is resurrected than he did before he died. You thought he he was glorious and majestic and beautiful. But after Jesus died for the church, after he shed his blood, after he conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, you look better, Jesus. In fact, you look so glorious. We need another introduction to you. Mary didn't even recognize him. The disciples didn't even know who he was. You're different, Jesus. What you just went through was a rite of passage. You just went into enemy territory and established your right to be Lord of all. God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Look at here. The church is somebody. Come on, help me give God some praise. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. 
church. And since Jesus said it's mine, that means Jesus still runs the church. Hello? Oh, yes. Don't you let nobody tell you, oh, child, I run this church. Well, you better be careful about running your mouth on God's property. One thing about it, if he don't wake you up in the morning, you ain't going to run nothing, not even your mouth. Jesus still runs the church because the church is not a human organization. Hello? Oh, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, a lot of people have taken the intellectual property of Christ and tried to put it under human control. That's what we find happening in Matthew chapter 18 when humans get involved in carnal conflicts, when they can't get along with each other, when they don't love each other, don't even respect each other. And that's why Jesus says in the church, if there is a conflict, here's what you do. You go to the one you got a conflict with. Don't get on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and talk about your brother or sister. You got something to say to me, come to me. Don't go to nine other folk. If you have an odd with your brother, if your brother trespass against you, go to him. Now, if he doesn't hear you, then you get two or three other seasoned saints. Don't get nobody with a short fuse. Don't get no trigger happy person. Get somebody that's rooted and grounded, long suffering, somebody that's really saved. And then you reason with that person. You're dealing with conflict here. I'm not talking about outside on the street. I'm talking about when the devil tries to bring hell up in the church. And then Jesus said the second time that he even uses the word church, if he neglect to hear them, then you tell it to the church. The third and final time that Jesus uses the word church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican, which means your fellowship is disconnected. It's in your Bible. And then he backs it up with kingdom authority. I'm telling you, whatever you bind on earth, I'll sanction it and bind it in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose it in heaven. If any two of you shall agree, that's the situation right there. There's too much disagreement, too much division, too many cliques, too many little groups in the church. You can't be anointed, divided. If any two of you shall agree, why don't you look at somebody and ask them, will you agree with me in prayer? Will you agree with me in worship? Will you agree with me in praise? Agreement means that when my cup is running over, if you ain't got nothing, at least something ought to get in your saucer out of my cup. Agreement means if you praise in God, I want to rejoice with them that do rejoice. I want to praise with them that praise. I want to be edified by the fact that God's anointing in you is edifying my life. The Bible teaches us they were with one accord. Hello? They were with one accord. If you agree to be one, God got miracles for you. God's got a breakthrough for you. God has an anointing for you. But he will not anoint confusion. He will not anoint pride. He will not anoint division. Let me hear somebody say agreement. And then he says, for where two or three are gathered, what's the word? Together. Why don't you look at somebody and tell them, we're together. Why don't you start a room and let it go all through town? We're together. Somebody's got to say, they're together over there at Mount Airy. <laughs> if you gather together in my name, there am I. 
And that's really who we came to see. Anyhow, we came to see Jesus. And some people can't see Jesus when they come to church because we got too much self in the way, too much fighting, too much division, too much competition, too much carnality, too much pride. They can't see Jesus through that. By this shall all know that you are my disciple, by the love that you have one to another. Look at Jesus tackle it in Matthew 18 and 1. He's building the kingdom. He's building the church. And while Jesus is putting on the fight against hell, here comes his disciples. They have one question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Don't care nothing about witnesses. Don't care anything about souls being saved. Not concerned about people being healed and set free. I want to know who's going to be in charge. Because you said you're going to die. You said you're going to be crucified. And since you're going to die, somebody got to run this. Jesus can run the church better from hell than you can sitting up in here in person. I keep telling you the church is not a human organization. It is a spiritual organism. Romans 8 and 9. If anyone have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of it. If you got the spirit, every now and then some power ought to move through your life. Your hand ought to go up. Some tears ought to flow. Some joy ought to be experienced in your soul. Some word ought to take root in your spirit. Come on, help me give God a mighty praise in here today. Jesus invades enemy territory. He goes where he's unwanted, uninvited. He goes where the enemy says, I'll destroy you. I hate you. I'll kill you. Well, you might kill me, but you can't destroy me because I'll come back from death and put my feet on the serpent's head. Jesus proved that he's Lord even after going through the cross, after going through the death of the cross, the burial in the grave, after going through preaching in hell. Can you imagine Jesus preaching in hell? I've taken a temporary leave of absence from my body. My body is in a tomb that I borrowed for three days. But while my body is in a tomb, I gotta do business in the spirit. In the spirit, he went to the place of departed spirit. He went to the place of bondage. He went to the place where souls were the captives of death. And he preached until death had to set them free. He led captivity captive. He took back Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He took back Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. These are my captives. Give them back to me. I just shed my blood to claim them for my kingdom. Somebody ought to help me shout glory. That's why Jesus couldn't talk about the word church until 16 chapters into the book of Matthew because if you're going to talk it, you better be able to back it up. Jesus talked it and then he backed it up by shedding his blood, by defeating sin, death, hell, and the grave, by dying on the cross of Calvary. Now that I've shed my blood, the church is alive. Now that I've defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave. The church is alive. The church means called out, birthed out, brought out. I brought you out of hell. I birthed you out of confusion. I birthed you out of darkness. I birthed you out of addiction. I freed you. Now you belong to me. Come on, help me give God some. Anybody here know about being born again? This is why then Jesus, after having said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot stop it, shall not prevail against it. Let me give some keys out. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, let me, give, let me get out some keys here. I got to get some keys. Keys to what, Jesus? You mean to tell me you going to give me church keys? Why don't you look at somebody and ask them, you got any keys of this church? 
<laughs> Jesus said, no, I, I can't give you no church keys, so I haven't built it yet. I got to die first. I got to go into hell first. I got to defeat sin, death, and the grave. I can't give you no church key. I can give you some kingdom keys. Here they are. They're the keys you want. Now, why you want to argue with somebody? I ain't got no key to the church and don't even carry a Bible. Don't even read it. Wonder if you believe it and then want to know, how come I ain't got no keys to the You got keys to the kingdom. Are you using them? Are you binding the enemy? Are you putting them under your feet? Are you walking in kingdom authority? Are you walking in dominion? You got keys. Use your kingdom keys. Nobody in here can say Jesus hasn't offered you keys to the kingdom. Nobody can say that Jesus didn't die to give you a right to walk in power and kingdom dominion. Nobody has the right to say Jesus didn't give me power to pray, power to minister, power to witness, power to overcome. You got keys, but you spend so much time arguing over foolishness. <laughs> You spend so much time drowning in division that the devil looking at you laughing while you won't even use the power you already got. Don't even use the power of praise, the power of worship, the power of intercession. Use your keys. <laughs> got the nerve to come into church looking for a fashion show. Ooh. Did you see that hat? Did you see what he had on today? And got keys to the kingdom, won't even use it. Don't even have enough authority to bring our children to church. Children sitting up at home looking at HBO and you speaking in tongues. I dare you to shout. Use your keys. Jesus said, I'm giving keys out. And I trust you with authority to the kingdom. What is the kingdom anyway? Well, it's not what the kingdom is. It's what it ain't. Uh-oh. Don't you help me with it. Look at somebody and tell them, it ain't what the kingdom is. It's what it ain't. They said there was a man that was a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River, and he's been doing it for nearly 40 years. And the man walked up to him and said, man, you've been a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi for 40 years. He said, you ought to know where all the rocks are. And the riverboat pilot looked back at him and said, no, I don't know where the rocks are. I know where they ain't. <laughs> I know that if you stay midstream, stay off the margins, stay off the sideline, stay out of distraction, stay out of clicks, stay out of confusion, stay out of personality cult, stay in the center of the river, you will avoid collision. It ain't what the kingdom is, it's what it ain't. Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not position. It's not prestige. It's not clothes. It's not money. It's not recognition. What is it? Righteousness. Joy. Peace. Where? In the Holy Ghost. Let me hear somebody say the Holy Ghost. Come on, give God some praise for the Holy Ghost. Give him worship in the Holy Ghost. Come on and give him praise here today. Oh, we need this sermon. Ooh, Lord have mercy. We needed this word. Just like you, you might feel like, I don't need no bath. All you got to do is get in there and look back. We needed this word. The disciples walked up to him. I just want to know who's the greatest. You've got a mission in hell, a mission to overcome demonic possession, a mission to overcome sickness and disease, a mission to overcome the curse of mental illness, a mission to overcome even slavery on our minds. We've had laws passed to get us out of the institution of slavery. They don't have to worry about that. If I can put it in your head, I'll never have to worry about putting chains on your hand. 
We've got a challenge. Jesus tells us, that's why I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. I'm sending you in the midst of danger, and you're going to make it. And in the midst of that charge to ministry, here comes somebody strutting up. I want to know who's going to be in charge. Who's the greatest? And Jesus said, well, let me sit everybody down. I sat every last one of them down and then said, come here, baby. Got a little child. Put him right in front of these ambitious grown men and said, except you be converted, means you ain't even saved yet. Except you get saved, except you be converted, and after getting converted, become as little children, you ain't going to even get in the kingdom, much less run it. Much less be the greatest in it. You want to know who's greatest? Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is what? Greatest in the kingdom. You want to be great? Humble yourself. You want to be great? Swallow your pride. You want to be great? Be anchored in his purpose and will. You want to be great? Serve the Lord. Do his will. Help somebody. Reach out and bring people through the love, the agape love of Jesus. Greatness is in serving. Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But Jesus said, let me give you a stern warning. Verse 6, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. You want to get Jesus mad. You want to get Jesus upset. You trifle with his little ones. And it doesn't matter what your position or title is. If you are corrupted with that kind of demonic spirit, there is no covering for you. There is no excuse for you. There is no transfer for you. Jesus gives a zero tolerance policy. If you offend the least of these, my little ones, it's better for you that a millstone were hanged about your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Don't play with God's children. God will mess you up. Any spirit that comes to corrupt God's little ones, any spirit that comes to take their innocence, any spirit that not will not stand up for children is a spirit from hell. I still don't understand how police officers with body armor and shields and glocks couldn't even fight for little children in a classroom. You there with a badge, all that firepower, and scared to even try to lock on the door to open it. There's a spirit in this country that hates children, that traffics in children, that abuses children. Don't let it live in the church. Cast it out. Not many folk going to shout on this sermon. This is a real meat and potatoes stick to your rib. If your properties are in the wrong place, it's time to set things right. The question is not who's the greatest. The question is, Lord, where will you have me to serve? And when God gives you the right and the anointing to serve. Don't let haters drive you away from your calling. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. And a jealous, narrow-minded, hateful, competitive spirit does not belong in the church. You see somebody pouring their heart out to God, trying to serve God's kingdom, trying to do their will, and you sitting up doing nothing, you better be careful with your mouth because you're going to have to stand before an almighty God. We got some issues right up in the church. We got some sins to repent of right up in the church. We got some pride, some stronghold to pull down right up in the church. 
the church. That's why you need to forget about these keys and pick up these keys. I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It's time for you to bind up evil in the church. Bind up jealousy in the church. Bind up pride and confusion in the church. And let revival break out in our souls. Lord, send revival. Oh, Lord, sin restoration, sin healing, sin miracles, but let it begin with me. Hear him, my Lord. I hear your voice. Hear him, my Lord. I receive your word. Yes, Lord. Yes to your will. Yes to your word. Yes to your commandment. Oh, I'm willing to go all the way. Jesus says, let's build the church. But while we're building it, let's not run from the challenge. For once you begin to build, you stir up hatred and opposition among the enemy. For the Bible says that when they began to build the walls, when Nehemiah stood upon the wall, then Sanballat came and began with criticism that wall ain't nothing if a fox gets on that wall it'll break down the wall in fact Nehemiah come on and talk with me we need to have a conversation but Nehemiah says I'm not gonna stop building the Lord's work to waste time filibusting with you I'm doing a good work I'm not gonna come down from the wall Keep on fasting, keep on praying, keep on believing, keep on being faithful, keep on worshiping, keep on lifting the name of Jesus, keep on teaching sound doctrine, keep on loving one another, keep on praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm encouraged to walk with Jesus, I'm encouraged to let my light shine. I'm I'm encouraged to give him glory. I'm encouraged to lift up his name. Anybody here encouraged? Been through the pandemic, been through on the parking lot, been through the winter, in the midst of the storm. I know many have died, many have given up, many have gone astray, but God still has a remnant. Anybody know you're the remnant? God saved me for a reason. God kept me alive for a reason. God healed my soul for a reason. God fought my battle for a reason. I'm not here accidentally. I'm not here coincidentally. I'm here by the grace of God, by God's grace. I am who I am. I am where I am. By God's grace, I'm a living miracle. By God's grace, I am a living testimony. Anybody got a testimony today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody stand. Look at somebody and tell them, I am a living testimony. Come on, look at somebody else and tell them, I am a living testimony. I'm a walking miracle. I'm a witness to the power of God. I'm a witness that God is a healer. I'm a witness that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. I've come too far to turn around now. I've come too far to get discouraged now. I've come too far to give up now. Say yes. Say yes. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. Glory. We love your name. We love your name. Do you love him today? We love your name. We love your name. We praise your name. We celebrate your name. We call your name. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. 
May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.